Hello, everyone. I see we have a number of folks who have joined. We're just going to wait a few more minutes. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to wait a minute past one. Um, see, we have a bunch of folks who have joined, but um, might have some some folks a minute minute late. Okay, it is one minute past, so I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar today. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time on the middle of a Wednesday. Um, I'm sure everyone has a lot of work going on. Everyone's busy, um, but you're going to learn a lot from this webinar. I'm really, really excited. There is a chat button. I see Maria Martin just, just wrote greetings from Alabama. Um, and everyone could, we want to make this as interactive as possible. We're going to have a question and answer at the end, but feel free to just comment and, you know, put notes in and we can discuss. So today's webinar, Blanket Project are both creating the perfect insurance requirements set up in your Procore account. Um, we're going to go through the hosts, starting with Sajad and then ending with myself. And then I'm going to uh, go over the itinerary, what we're going to be talking about today, and then we'll, we'll get started. So Sajad, take us away. Sure. Thank you, Scott. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sajad Mamun. I'm the construction risk manager for JRM Construction Management. Hi, I'm Janet Caps, operations administrator for Key Construction. Hey, everybody. My name is Justin. Um, I'm a technical implementation manager here at Jones. I focus on setting up new customers, getting them on the platform, and then specializing in our integrations, such as Procore. And my name is Scott Wasatsky. I'm the product marketing manager here at Jones, and I'm going to be kind of like moderating uh, this webinar today. So what we will be covering, first, we're going to be um, understanding the differences between project level and blanket insurance requirements, why you would want to use each set of these in insurance requirements up next, um, because they're both great different types of insurance requirements, great ways of managing risk, but they're they're not ideal for all situations. Third, we're going to go over a playbook on how to select subcontractors that would be great candidates for blanket insurance requirements. And then four, we're going to hand it over to Janet, and she's going to show us uh, the view of subcontractors with blanket project and both sets of insurance requirements in Procore. And then we're going to hand it over to Justin from our team. We're, we're going to be going over setting up project level and blanket insurance requirements in Procore with Jones. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So you can ask questions throughout. Um, you know, if I ask a question, feel free to answer it in there. But if you have broader over bigger questions, we're hopefully going to have five or 10 minutes at the end uh, and go over a Q&A. So starting off, project versus blanket insurance requirements. <laughs> Sorry, recovering from uh, I, I had COVID last week, so uh, excuse my, uh, my my small coughs. But um, subcontractors will need to basically submit either project or blanket level insurance requirements, insurance documents with specific um, for specific specific requirements to the project they're working on. We're going to call those project, and then on the blanket set of insur insurance requirements. It's one set of insurance documents with the requirements that have all of the limits and endorsements applicable to all of your all, all of your projects. So we're going to go over project first. Um, let's do a quick overview. Sajad, can 
Can you explain what project level insurance requirements are in your words? And I'll put this on the screen um, while you're talking. Sure. Um, so project level insurance requirements are a specific set of insurance requirements relating to the exact project that a subcontractor will work on. They are unique uh, to cover the specific requirement for that project, uh, level of coverage that is required from subcontractor, and address proper risk transfer from the prime contract for that project. Uh, for example, um, a project may be um, within the 50 feet of railroad, uh, and all subcontractors will have to be on board with um, the endorsement CG 2417 uh, within their insurance policies to work within that uh, range of distance from the railroad. So that could be addressed in the uh, project, uh, project specific requirement. Similarly, if the project is OSIP or CSIP or residential, we may have slightly different requirement that would need to be addressed uh, from the specifics and coverage uh, level perspective. Uh, sometimes it could be some location requirements too. Uh, and you know, it basically to tell uh, and specify, identify and specify the what a specific project needs and transfer those risks to the subcontractor in a, through an insurance requirements. Thank you, Sajai, that was great. Um, the other set of insurance requirements that we're gonna be talking about today are blanket insurance requirements. Um, these can also go by annual subcontractors because they only need to update their insurance documents once per year, hence the word annual. Uh, that's how a lot of teams think about them or global level insurance requirements because the one set of insurance documents is all that the subcontractor needs uh, to be globally compliant across all projects. Um, I'm going to go to the next, the next one. Um, blanket. So Janet, could you give us, um, you know, in your words, blanket insurance requirements, what are they? I think Janet's on mute. Um, Janet, you're just going to want to unmute yourself. <laughs> we'll give Janet a moment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we hear you. We hear you fine. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. So, <laughs> on... Um... On blankets, um, these are the requirements that the limits and the endorsements and coverages can be applied to all projects in a company portfolio and use a broader additional insured language that extends additional insured coverage to all parties as required per written contract. At key, we add the wording to our certs, all work by named insured at all locations in place of the project number, name and locations for our blanket insurance requirements. Um, we also have different types of blanket insurance requirements as you can see on the next slide. And in this view, this is from our Jones account. And as you can see, we have many different types of blanket insurance requirements and they follow the different types of contracts that are issued to our subs. And so for example, if a, sub is, has a high blanket, then they would have a higher, higher umbrella limit or uh, so they would be high blanket, high blanket plus pollution would be higher umbrella plus pollution. Um, and then for any just of our regular projects, they would have a standard blanket and many more. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. That was great. So now we're now that Sajad and Janet have described to us the difference of project versus blanket, why would you want to use each of these set of insurance requirements? So I just want to comment for a moment that um, we have seen at Jones, I've been at Jones a little over two years, um, and we've seen that construction customers who use blanket insurance requirements have an, a higher average compliance rate of about 18% than those who use project, project specific requirements. It's just something to keep in mind, but we'll be talking about shortly you know, just because there's higher compliance rates associated with blanket blanket insurance requirements doesn't mean it's right for everyone. So I'd be curious to hear, this is going to be one of the interaction interactive moments. I'd be curious to hear from everyone on the webinar today, 
are you using project specific insurance uh, requirements on your projects that you're working on or, or are you using blanket insurance requirements or are you using a combination of both so feel free to type in the comments uh, section let us know we, we're curious what are you using on your projects all the subcontractors what requirements so Lori Moser Lori great to great to see you again I know you were on our last webinar um Project specific, Danielle, project, project specific, project specific for all jobs. Tiffany says a combo, but mostly project specific. Linda says project specific. Nicole Carter, project specific. Most people are using project specific. Really, really interesting. Well, I guess this will be a, um, I guess this will be um, a good, a good webinar to explore the additional uh, set of requirements, blanket. Uh, insurance requirements and see maybe how you can fit that into your into your mix. Um, so now I'm going to hand it over to Sajad and Janet to talk about why they use project first blanket insurance requirements. So with Jones, with Jones, um, you know, software and the Procore integration, Sajad uses project specific insurance requirements. And with Jones and our Procore integration, Janet uses a combination of both project specific and blanket insurance requirements. So Sajad, can you walk us through uh, why you use project specific insurance requirements um, at JRM with Jones? Uh, sure. Um, so basically, you know, we use a combination of blanket and uh, project specific requirements, but we use Jones uh, as our project uh, compliance tool. So we utilize Jones for project specific okay. compliance verification. But what the way actual uh, workflow works at our organization is that we have a master service agreement, which would have sort of blanket insurance requirements that will that each of our subcontractors uh, will uh, you know negotiate and execute. And then under those master service agreement, we will issue all project specific uh, requirements for each individual project that they will be working on. Uh, and we do this through Jones, the uh, Jones because you know, we utilize Jones as a project specific tools. But you know, we, we prefer project specific even though we have a blanket in place is because like I said previously, you know, project specific needs are more specific to this uh, particular project. And we have to address the specific scenarios uh, of the project. Uh, and you know, it, it's it's basically to maintain consistency from prime contract to subcontract. Make sure the proper contractual risk transfer is um, happening through the insurance requirements. Uh, make sure that project needs uh, are being met. So, for example, like I in my previous example, I've talked about uh, OC or CC project that could be uh, you know uh, need additional. Uh, pro insurance provisions and insurance uh, control pro controlled insurance program manuals to be included within the insurance requirements, as well as you know different types of other requirements. If it's a different, for example, if it's it sometimes is a location issue too. So if it's sometimes if, for example, if the project is in New Jersey, New Jersey has um, New Jersey prohibits waiver of subrogation for workers' compensation, so we may not require that in the New Jersey uh, insurance requirements, because you know, for workers' compensation, uh, they wouldn't be able to provide us the waiver of subrogation. Uh, similar to residential project, you know, if, if there is a residential project, we wanna make sure that there is no residential exclusion uh, into the subs, uh, subcontractors insur uh, insurance policies. So, you know, better fit the project needs, better fit the location specific needs, better fit the contractual risk transfer uh, we use the project specific, uh, and since we do a lot of volumes of work, uh, and you know we uh, utilize Jones to you know maintain compliance and verify compliance uh, for the project specific requirements. Thank you, Sujad. Thank you. Um, now let's let's turn it over to Janet to hear why key construction uses a combination of of. Uh, both project specific insurance requirements and blanket insurance requirements with Jones. So as the operations 
perspective, um, we can say that it's a lot easier if we are using, if we're working with subs that have a blanket insurance in place, um, we only have to worry about obtaining a subcontractor's certificate of insurance at its expiration date, which is once a year, even if they're working across many projects. So managing, collecting, and worrying about expiration dates for one certificate of insurance, as opposed to 10 different ones for the same sub subcontractor is, is just much easier for our team. Um, and it's not just easier for, for us, but easier for our subs and their agents. Before Jones, we collected all of and, and reviewed all of our certs that came into the Wichita office and all of our other offices. And we highly encouraged blanket search just to help with the, with the workload. Um, but in, <clears throat> excuse me, in working with the, um, with the blankets, the subs also liked this as well. Um, they liked the flexibility of being able to submit a COI once a year and that grants them access to all of our different projects. Um, and they don't have to go through the, the paper chase all, all the time. So for example, we have subcontractors that work at um, our Baylor Scott and White hospital system in Texas. And we have multiple campuses that they work at. And so they're easily able to work across all those campuses with just one set of insurance documents and can start working on new locations much easier. So this is great for their business and, and for ours as well. So as you can see from the map, um, we have, there are several campuses that, that we work at for, for Baylor, Scott and White. And it also aids in tight schedules and short deadlines if we're needing a subcontractor to start work on a project ASAP, we can automatically know that they're compliant with blanket insurance requirements and they can start work almost immediately. And we're avoiding that paper chase of back and forth. Also with blanket insurance requirements, it's easier and faster for accounts payable. We check for insurance compliance on a project by project basis before we issue any payments. So with blanket insurance requirements, we can issue multiple payments at once for all projects a subcontractor may be on because we know that they're already compliant. So not that a blanket insurance requirement actually works for all instances, um, sometimes a subcontractor um, uses multiple insurance agents for different coverages, and that does become a challenge to coordinate with all of those different parties to get the correct wording and all of those coverages. And also, if we're on a project that falls under a CSIP or an OSIP, then the project-specific COIs need to be issued. So we can't use blanket insurance for those particular projects. And if you're not aware what a CSIP is, it's Contractor Controlled Insurance Program, and an OSIP is Owner Controlled Insurance Program. And it's basically just depending on um, who is managing that particular program. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, that, was, that was amazing. So now we're going to go over a playbook for selecting which subcontractors might be a good fit to ask for blanket insurance requirements. And it's really interesting. Most people, uh, most folks on the comments section commented that they use project specific insurance requirements. These are four tips or four ways uh, that you might want to go about thinking to ask a subcontractor for blanket insurance requirements if, if you think it's the right fit. So number one, identify subcontractors that are already working on multiple projects, right? So if you have a subcontractor working across multiple projects, it could make sense to get them, that's that specific sub set up with blanket insurance requirements. So in Jones, we've talked with a lot of customers. I'm the product marketing manager here. So I talk with a lot of customers 
And we know that our customers often use uh, the master compliance report to pull this list of data. So this is a report that you can go to in Jones. Right? Jones has a Procore integration, um, which Janet's going to be showing us later, how it works, with everything inside Procore. Then we have Jones standalone. Um, and as on, in the Jones standalone um, uh, website, you can just click on click on the master compliance list, and then you can see a list of, um, of of this data. So Jones customers can go right in. You can download a report that looks like this and see how many subcontractors are working across various projects. Um, and then I also want to show everyone a brand new feature we're going to be launching uh, next week. It's actually called the account directory. So I know we have some Jones customers on this call. I saw in the in the comments section we have some 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 customers um, on here who are already using Jones. This might look brand new to you, but this will be live on your account on Monday next week. You'll be able to just click this button on top, this little book button or directory button, and you can see all the different subcontractors on your account, see what states they're working in, how many projects they're on, et cetera. Um, and this is really great because like Acme Plumbing, for example, right? We can see it's in Florida and it's working across 15 projects. So maybe this would be a good candidate to uh, to offer them blanket insurance requirements and not just the project specific ones, if, if it makes sense. Um, so Janet, when you're evaluating a subcontractors, because you use a combination, some project, some project level, some blanket insurance requirements, does the number of projects that a subcontractor is on, does that matter to you? Not necessarily. We don't really, <laughs> it's not a matter of how many projects they're working on with us. But um, if they do have a blanket, we do require that the general liability aggregate limit apply on a per project basis, not on a per policy basis. And so this allows ample coverages should anything occur. Um, at the hospital ma master service agreement work, it works well with our blanket insurance requirements. Since the subcontractors move from one campus to another, and we also have subcontractors, subcontractors, excuse me, that follow from our national accounts team and our mission critical teams that work across the United States. And we like to have them have blanket insurance requirements so that we're not constantly doing that paper chase with them. Awesome. So point number two is to see if the subcontractor, um, you know, do, do they resolve compliance well? Um, how how well do they work in resolving compliance with you? Um, have they been good up until this point? Does it take a long time to work through deficiencies in their insurance requirements? With Jones, you can actually click into the vendor history tab. Every every vendor, every subcontractor you work with has a history tab. I took a screenshot of uh, one from Janet's account, and I actually just I just blurred out um, you know the emails and some personal information on there. Um, when you click into it, you can you can see what in Jones how long it takes a subcontractor to get compliant. Um, so you can see the vendor was created, and then an invitation was sent for the COI. The first reminder, second reminder was uploaded. The vendor was not compliant. And then uh, you know, so how how active are they? Um, right, you're gonna want to if you're gonna offer someone blanket insurance requirements, you want them to be active um, and trying to get things resolved with you. Um, Janet and Sajad, can you tell us a little bit about certain vendors that are actively engaged in fixing compliance issues with you and uh, some that are not? Um, I'll hand it off to Janet, Janet first, I guess. Okay. Um, well, we've had to educate some of our subs and their agents um, as they don't fully understand some of the coverages that are required in our subcontract agreement. Um, and if we're working with that new sub, or it could be a, they could be a smaller business that's trying to build their business. And so they've, in working with us, they've had to um, have their policies rewritten to meet some of our requirements of our subcontract. Um, over the years, some of these smaller businesses have gone from a personal policy to a commercial coverage. And in doing so, they were awarded additional contracts on other projects with key construction, and we've developed a lasting working relationship with them. But on the other hand, we have smaller subcontractors that since they don't carry the requirements that we need and don't want to add the 
expense of upgrading their policies. Um, we do face challenges with those in some cases. And so sometimes um, we're not able to work it out and they back out of our subcontract and we have to move on to a, a different sub. Sajad, what's, um, what, what, what's your experience like um, working with subcontractors trying to get them compliant? Um, yeah, I mean, the subcontractor space is a little bit tricky in, in, in a sense that, you know, uh, a lot of them don't have in-house risk management team. Uh, they don't always necessarily understand the requirements or coverage gap, potential co coverage gaps. Um, so some, uh, sometimes, like Janice, Janet said, you know, the subcontractor is a little bit small businesses trying to grow their market. Um, so they don't have necessarily purchase power to have certain coverages that are crucial for us. But, you know, at the same time, uh, we we treat our subcontractors as, as our internal partners. We try to assist them, uh, even sometimes act on their behalf uh, to uh, ensure they secure they are securing correct coverages when we do need to go out in the market. They do need to go out in the market and secure coverages, but we do uh, act as their resources uh, when we need them uh, to secure proper coverages. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. It's a combination of business decision, uh, you know, maintaining long-term relationships um, because relationships are important and how well the subcontractor, you know, has been working for us in the past uh, and, you know, what's their willingness, willing, willing, willingness to uh, work with us uh, for, a, for a particular instance. So all these things get considered uh, get into consideration and then we, you know, try our best to help them. Uh, sometimes may give them leeways to, you know, be compliant. Sometimes we con uh, make concession concessions for them uh, to work out, uh, work with them. So it depends on the relationship, business decision, and, you know, um, uh, uh, our overall uh, holistic look at the certain scenarios. Uh, for us to make them uh, have them compliant. Awesome. Thank you, Sajad. Um, so now we're going to go over the um, the third point. Do you and the subcontractor actually want to work together again? Uh, does the subcontractor want to work with you again? Do you want to work with the subcontractor again? It doesn't really make sense to give someone blanket insurance requirements um, uh, if you only want them on one project and never want to see them again. <laughs> so taking insurance out of the picture for a moment, um, think about the quality of the work. Do they work well? Uh, do the project managers on your team? I don't know if we have any project managers on today. I think it's mostly folks in the risk world, but, um, but you know, project managers might come to you and say that they won't, don't want to work in the subcontractor again. Sajad and Janet, what are your thoughts on this? And I guess Sajad, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to you first. Um, what what would you have to say about reasons why you would never want to work with a subcontractor again, or maybe want to continue working with them? Um, well, it, it it depends on the you know relationship. Like I said, we we treat them um, as our important important partner, and we want to work with most of them. Uh, but at the same time, there are some crucial items that needs to be addressed. Um, if so, we look at them uh, holistically. We just don't rely on the insurance requirements of their insurances, this or that. No, we we do have global pre-qualification in place. What we do that uh, what we do within that pre-qualification aspect of the sub when we are bringing on a new sub on board, they will have to submit our pre pre-qualification questionnaire. They will have to submit their financials. They will have to. Uh, we will do their safety records will do uh, verify their safety record legal records uh, as well as insurance policy review um, so we take a holistic look at the subcontractors as well as our experience on that field working with them uh, so we always try to make sure that the decision we are making is not just because of one topic of insurance but it's a holistic business decision an informed business decision, uh, most importantly. 
um, you know, uh, if subcontractor has lesser coverage, but they are good on site, we have, uh, they have delivered quality projects passed for us, then, you know, like I said, we will act as a risk manager on their behalf to have them secure necessary coverage, uh, what we deem crucial for us. Thank you, Sujad. Um, um, that's why you would never want to wear wood in any instance. Well, Sajad kind of went over most of my points as well, but we too consider our subcontractors as a partner and we want to continue working with those subs that work well with our teams and that do quality work. At the end of the day, we all want to turn over a project that exceeds our owner's expectations. Um, so I guess as far as maybe not wanting to work with a subcontractor again, we might choose to part ways with them if they aren't safety conscious or they're not able to provide enough manpower for the project. Um, and sometimes they're just not a good fit with, with our teams. Thank you, Janet. Um, and then number, point number four, are they responsive to the opportunity? Um, do they actually want to get blanket insurance requirements? Because these are going to be a different set of insurance requirements. Things are going to be different. Um, Janet, you previously mentioned that some brokers actually that, that you've seen in, in, in your career, some brokers don't like to provide subcontractors with blanket insurance requirements. Can you further share your th thoughts why a broker would not want to provide a subcontractor with uh, blank insurance requirements for your projects? Yes, sure. I I think that it's more of a, for tracking purposes, um, they want to know where their insureds are working and depending on what state they're working in, they want to ensure that their subs have all their coverages um, that are required for that particular state to work in. But that's, that's the reasons that i have you know that we've heard as to why they don't like to use a blanket awesome thank you um all right i want to share an example here on the screen um this is an example email template that one of our customers uses to request blanket insurance requirements from subcontractors who have previously been submitting project level insurance and this is what they send them over when they want to kind of convert them or uh not convert when they want to just kind of transfer like, Hey, you know, you've been doing each project, one set of insurance now just submit one set of insurance requirements with us and you're good. So here it is on the screen. Shout out to Jessica Maxwell from Harvey Cleary builders. Um, great. They're a great, uh, customer of ours. Jessica was not able to be here today on the call, but, uh, thank you for letting us use this screenshot. Please comment below in the, in the webinar chat section if you want a copy of this and I can email it over to you. Like I can just copy and paste this over to you instead of a screenshot so that you could um, use this in um, um, in your personal outreach or in your day-to-day -day jobs. You can just direct message me on the webinar chat or you can just post in the webinar chat. Just say like, hey, I want a copy and um, I'll send it over. So. Yeah, everyone, everyone will be getting a call recording of this webinar. Um, but if you want this, just message me. I'd be happy to send it over. So now I want to hop over to Procore. And I want to ask Janet um, to show how she uses the Jones integration and how she uses it in Procore and sees the subcontractors with both project level and blanket insurance requirements in the different areas of Procore. I think everyone on this call is a is a Procore user, so um, so Jet Dal would be really great from Janet, and then Justin from our implementation team is going to go over setting up the insurance requirements that you want um, in Jones and in Procore and how easy it is to get started. But um, before we hop to the next slide, I want to ask everyone, what software are you using to manage subcontractor insurance documents? Are you doing this outside of Procore in a different software? Are you using Jones already? Are you um, using another app that integrates with Procore? Are you just doing this manually on Excel spreadsheets? Drop a comment below um, just cause, you know, it'd be great for us all to talk about this, all to know. So I'll wait uh, 30 seconds or so, just drop a comment. 
on what you're using to manage subcontractor COI, uh, COIs and insurance documents. Are you using another software that integrates with Procore? Are you using manual, manually doing this? I'll wait 10 or 15 more seconds. Danielle Keen from Holt Jones. Tiffany Blackmon Jones and Procore. Maria Martin to everyone. Jones to Procore is my favorite. Maria actually just uh, joined. Maria is a Procore technology consultant, and she just actually joined a um, joined a new company. So if anyone has any Procore Procore questions outside of insurance compliance, Maria Maria is your girl to contact. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, Janet, I'll hand it off to you. Walk us through how this all looks in your Procore account. Okay, so we can get into Jones by, if you click in the Jones app up in the upper right-hand corner and you can see a view within Procore of all the subcontractors that are working on a particular project. And we can see the subcontractors with project level insurance requirements for this particular job are up on top here. And then down below, we can see that the subcontractors with blanket insurance requirements. Um, the distinction across every project is very clear and you can easily add a new subcontractor to the project with project level insurance requirements by clicking on the orange button right up in the upper right hand corner. And if you click out of a specific project to the company directory and then go into the Jones app, you will see all the subcontractors with blanket level insurance requirements. And you can manage and add any new, um, any new companies by clicking the orange button at the right at the upper right hand side. So we can go into a project and look at a subcontractor within commitments tab or project directory to see the breakdown of their different insurance requirements. And as you can see here, um, we're gonna go, we're in the ins or in the commitments tab of, and we're gonna go into a subcontractor and you can see that their blanket level requirements on this side panel here and it's listed as company level um, and you can see that they're listed as compliant um, easy to see where what the status is and if the subcontractor had project level requirements um, they would be listed above the company level box um, I personally love this new side panel. I, I think it's been a game changer as far as what I do. Um, I am, I'm IERP, all of our commitments, and it's just such an easy way to, to keep everything in compliance. Everything's on just on a one screen and I can um, see a contracts, bonds, and if our insurance is compliant for our subs. I love it. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Justin Wiggins from our team, and he is going to talk about how you can set up uh, both project level and blanket insurance requirements in Procore with Jones from really a technical perspective. Justin's the one who leads uh, most, if not all, of our of our uh, customers through this process. So Justin, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, so one of the things that we wanna, that we start with when we're doing an implementation is we wanna understand your requirements. We wanna understand uh, what you need, not only for getting set up in Jones so that you're managing compliance the way that you want and need to, but also so that it will work well with Procore. You can see that there are different options the globals or blankets show up in a slightly different grid. And so we wanna make sure we get all these details right for your account. So one of the first things we do is send you a questionnaire. 
particularly if you're going to be using Procore, where we want to, among other things, know whether you're going to be using global insurance requirements or blanket insurance requirements. Um, one of the things that is um, important for this is, as you've seen on this call, the requirements can be different. Um, we want to understand in detail what, uh, what you need us to set up. So if you can go to the next slide, um, Scott. The something that frequently will come up is we get some uh, some insurance requirements. You uh, will receive a document that might be an exhibit from a contract. It might be a sample COI. It might be um, a list of different requirements. You know, policies with limits, uh, endorsements, verbiage, things of that nature. But it might only be one sheet of paper that lists all your requirements. And within that document, there is conditional language. Uh, things that say if applicable or if required. So you might see, okay, here's an example exhibit from our contract and it has uh, CGL, auto, uh, umbrella, workers' comp coverage, and then it'll say pollution if required, professional liability if required. Um, and so to make this as smooth as possible on Jones, we want to set you up with all of the different sets of requirements that you could need. So on the screen right now, what you're looking at is some example standard requirements. You can see the one at the bottom of the list is called AOS standard. And then there are some different tiers that have been identified. So there's a high risk. There's high risk plus pollution coverage, high risk plus professional liability coverage, plus crane. Um, these are the kind of details that we want to get into um, at the beginning of your implementation, whether we're talking about project specific requirements that can be standardized across projects or a global or blanket set of requirements. We want to know all of these details. Um, so I want to ask Sajad, uh, could you give us some examples about how you uh, thought about setting up and also how you set up insurance requirements with Jones when you uh, first got started with implementation? Um, sure. Uh Thank you, Justin. Uh, you know, you've you've already outlined and touched all of the topics that you said. Uh, we have the screen that is uh, you're showing right now is I think uh, from our account, and the way we set it set it up at the implementation level uh, is that we have two set of requirements. Uh, one is for New York only, and AOS stands for all other states uh, and we basically uh, have categorized different trades uh, to the uh, associated level of risk. So some are considered high risk such as, you know, plumbing, plumber, electricians, um, uh, concrete excavations, uh, scaffolding, and some are considered moderate risk, some are considered low risk, for example, uh, flooring painter. So we, you know, depending on the trade, we have we had set up at the implementation level uh, different sort of requirements and different uh, type of combinations. So when we setting up a project from whether I'm setting up from Procore or whether I'm just doing through Jones, once we set up the project, uh, we want to assign the subcontractor under that project. What we have, you know, depending on the trade they are they will be doing for that project, we will choose the correct uh, level of uh, requirement. So if, for example, if it's a demolition contractor, we'd probably choose, and if the job is in New York, we'd probably choose New York high risk and plus pollution. Um, and then that would be the requirement for them to be, submit, uh, to be submitted on Jones. So that's how we do it, depending on the trade, depending on the location, depending on level of uh, you know, risk and uh, associated uh, required coverages on our account. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Um, so as you can see, what we want to kind of front load this, we want to, when we're setting up uh, someone on uh, on the platform and for the integration, we want to get these sets of requirements ironed out at the beginning. We want to know what you need. We want to know all of the different permutations that you need, uh, as many as as possible in, in, in advance. Um, however, there are going to be new projects. There, are, There's always that one special project that has the crazy different requirements or um, policies change over time. Your, your corporation might, uh, you know, identify some, some company-wide changes where 
new requirements need to be added. So there is a way to do this through our integration. So what you're going to see on the screen here is when you go to add a new COI request or upload a COI uh, to Jones via the integration, if you click on that orange button, you can start the flow for adding somebody new. And it's going to ask you to select requirements. Um, the ones that will show up in this drop down menu for you are uh, the ones that we set up in advance on Jones. You just saw an example of that on the previous screen. But if you need something new, there is always the possibility of hitting add custom requirements in the integration. And when you click on that, it's going to launch a type form. Um, and this is a way to communicate directly with our team and have us build out additional sets of requirements that can be added to your Jones account. So we'll ask you know who you are. Uh, your, you know, the account name that you're working in, the particular project that this applies to, and then uh, you can add an attachment of the of the requirements, whether that's a sample COI, a Word document, a PDF, you know, wh whatever is relevant, and then you can submit it to us, and we'll build it out for you. Um, something to keep in mind when we're setting these up is that we really want to address, you know, 95 to 98 percent of the the different permutations and needs you're going to have for requirements. So we want to build sets that are going to enable you to not only work quickly and conveniently, but also not ask for coverages that are unnecessary. So that if most of your subcontractors don't need to provide pollution coverage. It's going to make sense to have one set that's like standard, one set that's standard plus pollution so that the subs are only being asked for the things that apply to them. But we know that there are exceptions. There are uh, deals that you work out with a, a particular sub. And so you're not always going to, there's not always going to be a perfect match between the requirement set and the particulars of that arrangement. So you can override and waive things on Jones. Um, you get different options. What you're seeing on the screen is an example of a vendor report where there's a gap in coverage that was flagged for auto liability. And if you'd like to waive that, you can hit uh, accept no exposure. That would indicate that really this doesn't apply to the particular subcontractor. There's no risk. And so you're just, uh, you know, accepting it. And then sometimes there are uh, business decisions, executive approval, different things that would say, yes, there, there may be some element of risk here, but we are going to uh, waive this gap in coverage for, for different reasons. Um, it's very easy to do in Jones. You can also restrict it by permission level so that only certain people can waive things. Um, I want to ask Janet and Sajad, Starting with Janet, uh, could you could you talk about how you go about waiving and overriding things in Jones? Sure, it's really based on the subcontractor's scope of work. So sometimes their limits can be lowered, or the additional terms can be adjusted or waived. So not all scopes of work have the same exposure to claims. So as an example, a painter that's applying wall covering will would not carry the same burden as, as a plumber on that project. So we could feel comfortable um, with the painter's coverages being adjusted or waived. However, we would very seldom do that for a plumber because his exposure to the occurrences or claims is greater. And so we're very careful to limit any of those exposures. That makes sense to me. Uh, how about you, Sajan? Uh, for us, you know, uh, you know, for, uh, in addition to the generality of what Janet said, you know, for us, a lot of the times this comes to a business decision, depending on what type of um, uh, flag uh, flagging we are addressing at that time. Um, if it's a limit issues uh, that they're not satisfying, we look at their trade, we look at the location, we discuss internally to make sure that, you know, we are making informed uh, decision. Uh, but if it's something that is crucial, such as, you know, if they have provided blanket additional insured endorsement, which has a uh, contractual privity issue, uh, then, you know, that's not going to be uh, an acceptable or uh, topic to waive, uh, item to waive because, you know, we have additional insured that do not hold it contractual relationship with the subcontractor. Uh, if it's an any auto 
uh, if the subcontractor does not have any auto but holds a scheduled auto uh, and hired and non-owned auto coverages, then we would ask them uh, to confirm via email that you know all of their own vehicles are scheduled onto the policy. Once they confirm that, then we'll waive the any auto requirement. Um, so it depends on the specific of uh, the topic that we, uh, or item that we are waiving, uh, but it always comes down to uh, either business decision or you know uh, an alternative solution. I do want to say that we actually have a webinar titled. Um, to waive or not to waive a crash course on insurance policy gaps and what they mean. I'm going to, I'm going to put a link right in there. I just sent it out to everyone. You can go to our website and look up that webinar. Um, it's a really great webinar that we did. Um, I think it was December of 2023, just about waiving and overriding gaps and um, deficiencies in, in, in insurance coverage. So um, you can use that resource as well. Um, I'll hand it back to Justin now. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Um, so one last thing that I want to talk about in terms of, of Procore and how we set these up that's that's important that some some folks don't know when we're, we're starting this is that when we're talking about project-specific insurance requirements and we're talking about standardizing requirements, that's usually something, you know, sometimes you already have standard requirements. Sometimes people come to us and they're looking to identify what their standard requirements are going to be. Um, from our perspective for getting this set, set up, um, additional insured and certificate holder information are not part of your standard requirements because we know that they're going to be different on almost every single project, especially for the additional insured. And so one of the nice features in our integration with Procore is you can create a new project on Jones by using Procore. So what you're going to see on the screen here is... Uh, you open up a project, you have something in Procore, you want to add it to Jones. You can click on that project, then you go and you try and load the Jones app. You've already set that up in advance and you get this screen. It doesn't exist yet on Jones. It needs to be created and, and therefore linked. And so uh, it's very easy to do this. It's a huge benefit of using the integration is you just click create project. It's going to ask you for three things. This can this can all go very, very quickly. You need to add at least one user. That's that first drop down you see. So, you know, somebody on the team needs to be added on the Jones side. And then you need to give us a list, a numbered list of your additional insured entities that you want to see uh, evidenced on a cert for this project. And then the certificate holder and their address. Um, so, it's just these three pieces of information. And then you can create the project um, and you're, you're up and running. Um, for uh, blanket insurance requirements, you're not going to be creating projects because they exist um, as a one central folder on Jones that works slightly differently. Um, but when you're thinking about setting up those initial uh, blanket insurance requirements, here are some trends that we see for with our customers. Um, if somebody's going to be approved um, to, to use a blanket, you know, one, one COI gets you access to all or most projects. Uh, usually there are higher umbrella limits. That's common. Um, the GL general liability coverages are, uh, the limits are a little bit higher, and then they can include uh, different provisions such as damage to rented uh, premises, medical expense coverage, um, and then the additional insured is always going to be different. So rather than saying, uh, you know, here's my numbered list of of entities, it's going to, there's going to be verbiage that you agree upon that refers to, uh, back to your contracts. So um, the cert needs to call back to the written contracts that you have with the sub, and that's what's going to dictate additional insured coverage. Um, it's possible to set up requirements uh, that are global or blanket that uh, require endorsements. And uh, so depending on how you want or need to handle things like coverage being primary non-contributory, whether a waiver of subrogation is needed, uh, common endorsements like CG 2010 or 2037, um, those, those all apply and can be set up for blanket insurance requirements. All right. So, um, in terms of the the globals and how how this looks in Jones, so we're basically going to set up 
it, it's a folder, but it's it functions just like a, a property or a project would on the Jones side. So you can see in the list, this is a key construction example. There are different projects that show up in their, their selector view. One of them is for global subcontractors. You can go in here and you see all of the global subcontractor uh, requirements. And then there are certain subs. So the subs live in this same folder as well. As you uh, got a sense of earlier in the presentation, on the Procore side, we link as part of our setup that folder on the Jones side to your global or company level view for the Jones app. And so very conveniently, you might have a list of 250 um, globally approved subcontractors that work on projects somewhere in your portfolio. When you add those subs to a given project, if they have a global cert in Jones, they'll automatically show up in this second half of the screen. So you don't, you're not going to see every single global sub that you work with, just the ones that apply to a given project. So you can see this project is called Grand Prairie Fire Station number six. There's a bunch of project level insurance requests and statuses, but the globals that apply that have been audited on Jones also show up automatically. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, Sajad. And thank you, Janet. Uh, um, this is, this is a wrap. So, uh, this is, thank you so much for everyone also for attending. You can email us all here, our emails, you can email us with any questions. We'd be happy to chat. Um, um, let's do a Q and a, you know, feel free to ask, ask away any questions. We, we have, uh, five more minutes. Maria says, thank you guys for coordinating this session. It was a good one. I definitely didn't expect to see a new feature so soon. That was extra. So yes, the account directory. If anyone wants to learn more about that too, you can send us an email. Maria, feel free feel free to drop your um, your email or your website if anyone wants to uh, learn more about your Procore consulting services. Um, but if anyone um, else has questions, we're we're here. Tiffany, Tiffany Blackman. If our insurance requirements on our subcontracts are always the same, unless extenuating circumstances on a project basis, would it make sense for us to switch from mostly project to mostly blanket insurance? What are the risks? So to, so to answer your first question, yes, it, it, it could make sense. What are the risks, if any, of doing so as I bring this up to management? Hmm. I can speak um, to that. Yeah, Justin. Um, this, this is a great question, um, and it's it's common. So um, the distinction you'd want to make would be between whether you want to have just standardized requirements uh, versus ones that are global or blanket. So if you standardize, then you're going to ask for the same coverages, the same limits, the same verbiage, same endorsements, all of that, and that's not going to change project to project, but you are going to want a separate <clears throat> for each uh, project that that someone is working on. So that's one consideration is how many pieces of paper do you want? Um, and then the additional insured question is going to be the other piece and, and the certificate holder is um, if you can standardize, then in Jones, you can have the same limits, coverages, all of that stuff required. And then each project is going to ask for the relevant uh, additional insured entities and cert holder. Um, and for some people, that's great. And that, that covers everything. It's super easy because the requirements aren't complicated on Jones, but they always have those uh, relevant entities. Um, on the global side, um, it's going to depend a lot on your contracts because the additional information section or the additional insured section of your requirements is going to refer back to written contracts. Some people have really detailed, really intense contracts that, uh, that are really good and, and set up really clearly. Other people have old contracts. Other people have uh, contracts that have uh, vaguer language. And so if you're referring back to a contract, um, you know, that, that would be an element of your, uh, your risk management. Thank you, Justin. Um, Tiffany, if if you want to chat about this more, I think you mentioned um, earlier that you're a Jones customer already, right? Um, feel free to reach out to your customer success manager. Um, not sure which customer success manager you are working with, but um, 
but all of our customer success managers would be able to assist you. You can also reach out to me or Justin. You have our emails on the screen. Um, and we'd be more than happy to um, maybe hop on a call or answer any other questions. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they want to ask? Denise, thank you. Thank you as well, Denise. Oh, we'll stay on the line for one more minute, um, waiting for any questions, and then we'll sign off promptly at at two. Tiffany, do you give your PMs access to WAVE or do you leave that to the upper level management? So we have, um, I believe it's four different types of uh, user permissions in Jones. Um, maybe Justin could correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's an admin, a compliance manager, an inviter, and then a read-only user, right? That's correct. Um, and, and then uh, certain, certain uh, roles have the ability to WAVE and override insurance caps and some don't. So Tiffany, um, risk managers can all be set up, for example, as compliance managers in Jones and have that ability. And then uh, an accountant or another type of PM, for example, they could be read only or or another type of role that doesn't um, and uh, that that Jones does not allow to waive or override gaps. How do you handle that, Janet? Um, we have our PMs as read only. Um, they need we want them to be able to use the Jones program, but not be able to waive anything. Any, um, the only people that are able to waive are the compliance managers in our company or an admin. So they go to management and ask, and then we waive it from there. Nice. So Jav, is it the same for you? Um, to some aspect, yes. Uh, we initially set up that way, but then it uh, created a uh, little bit of more confusion within the project team. Uh, so right now, only risk management team has access to the Jones um, because what happened with us is that when we gave project team the access to you know the compliance report on Jones or platform, they went to that and they don't necessarily understand all insurance lingos and provisions impacts and they get uh, very con confused and they think not, no one is compliant even though the those could be a minor issues and that created a lot of uh, back and forth and uh, between the risk management and the project team so we decided that to leave the project team out of Jones and to handle ourselves and we provide weekly update of the compliance status uh, for all projects that are ongoing to project team. Tiffany, one, one of the great things about our integration is that like PMs, for example, there's not oftentimes a lot of reasons for them to leave Procore. With our integration, it has uh, the app, the Jones app in there. They can see everything that they need. And like Janet was saying, they have the side panel so they can look at in, a, in the commitments. Uh, of, of a subcontractor and they can see the information that they need. The, I blurred out the, the email point of contact, but they can see um, all the details and everything. Um, so yeah, a lot of companies don't even want their PMs going into Jones. They just want them on there, on, on Procore, I mean. Well, we're two minutes over. Um, any any other questions um, before before we wrap it up? Going once, going twice. I think we're done. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You'll receive an email um, of this uh, recording later today. And um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. You too. Bye.